In this presentation, we'll finish up the book of Zechariah. We'll do chapters 9 through 14. A little introduction. The second part of Zechariah is mainly apocalyptic in character and consists of a number of loosely connected prophecies dealing with events that lead up to the final triumph of God's kingdom. Judah's hostile neighbors are to be cut off while the Lord protects his people. The Messiah is to come to speak peace to the nations, to have dominion from sea to sea, and to free prisoners from the pit. The Lord in the latter days will visit, gather, and redeem his people, but the pride of the wicked nations shall be brought low. This is followed in chapter 11, verse 4, by an allegoric description of the Lord's dealings with Israel, the latter in gratitude and resulting judgment. Chapter 12 opens with an account of a miraculous deliverance of Judah and Jerusalem from destroying nations in the latter days. A description of the spirit of grace, supplication, and mourning on the part of the inhabitants of Jerusalem over him whom they have pierced follows. Chapter 13 points out that a fountain is to be opened up to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. For sin and uncleanliness, idols are to be cut off and false prophets are to cease their activities, and the people are to ask concerning the wounds in the hands of him whom they have pierced. In the final chapter, 14, another account is given of the great assault of the nation on Jerusalem. While standing upon the Mount of Olives, the Lord delivers his people. The mount parts asunder to open up a way for them to escape. The enemy is destroyed with the exception of a remnant who adopted the worship of the Lord. So with that, let's begin with Zechariah chapter 9, verses 1 through 8, as he talks about the enemies of Judah. Many Bible scholars interpret these verses as having been fulfilled at the time of Alexander the Great. It is true that Alexander the Great, in approximately 332 B.C., destroyed these cities with his army, but the meaning of these verses is broader than that. Kyle and Delich, the great biblical scholars, explained, Of these, the prophet simply refers to Damascus and Hamath in general terms, and it is only in the case of the Phoenician and Philistine cities that it proceeds to a special description of their fall from their lofty enemy. And eminence because they stood nearest to the kingdom of Israel and represented the might of the kingdom of the world and its hostility to the kingdom of God, partly in the worldly development of their own might and partly in the hostility to the covenant nation. The description is an individualized one throughout, exemplifying general facts by particular cities. This is also evident from the announcement of the salvation for Zion in verses 8 through 10, from which we may see that the overthrow of the nations hostile to Israel stands in intimate connection with the establishment of the messianic kingdom. It is also confirmed by the second half of our chapter, where the conquest of the imperial power by the people of God is set forth in the victories of Judah and Ephraim over the sons of Javan. That the several peoples and cities mentioned by name are simply introduced as representatives of the imperial power is evident from the distinction made in these verses between the rest of mankind and all the tribes of Israel. So yes, a specific event of Alexander the Great is discussed and prophesied, but this is also a broader and much general scope in the hostilities instruction that is yet to come and the enemies of Judah to be conquered. Zechariah 9 verses 9 through 10. What special relevance did these verses have to the life of Jesus? After issuing a threat of judgment on the wicked nations surrounding Judah, Zechariah recorded a passage that both Matthew and John saw as having been fulfilled by Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem riding on a donkey's back. You can compare Zechariah 9.9 with Matthew 21, 1 through 11 and John 12, 12 through 15. Matthew uses this passage in the following way, so quoting Matthew, And when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, Jesus said, sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village that is over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone say aught to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and straightway he will send them. 
Now all this has come to pass, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through the prophet, saying, and now Matthew quotes Zechariah, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king comes to thee, meek and riding on an ass, and a colt, the foal of a beast of a burden. Finishing Matthew, And the disciples went and did as Jesus directed them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put them and put on them their garments, and he sat thereon. And most of the multitudes spread their own garments in the way. Others cut branches from the trees and spread them in the way. And the multitudes that went before him and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered into Jerusalem, all the city was shaken, saying, Who is this? The multitude said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Matthew 21, 1 through 11. Just one comment on that last phrase. This is why I would say the majority of people do not follow Christ. He is not the prophet of, from Nazareth of Galilee. This is the Messiah, born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth. They missed that. He was more than just a prophet. In John 12, 12 through 15, the passage in question is used quite similarly. John then makes this comment. These things his disciples understood not at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they did these things to him. John 12, 16. So it doesn't sound like until after the resurrection do they understand some of the scriptures and the fulfillment of Old Testament prophets. It is quite apparent that Zechariah 9.9 was regarded in New Testament times as having reference to the Christ. In Zechariah 9.10, the Messiah's dominion is represented as being from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. He also speaks peace unto the nations. We naturally expect the Messiah to give a message of peace. This verse still awaits its complete fulfillment. That is probably millennial as it sounds like. Gospel principle, all things testify of Christ, as it says in the book of Moses. Zechariah 9, 12, 11 through 12. Who are the prisoners mentioned in these verses? Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, It was of these that Zechariah prophesied when as part of a long messianic utterance, he spoke of prisoners of hope. It was of these that he gave assurance that the Lord their God shall save them. He gives the messianic message in these words, by the blood of the covenant, that is, because of the gospel covenant, which is efficacious because of the shedding of the blood of Christ. I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein there is no water. Zechariah 9, 11 through 16. Wherein is no water? How aptly and succinctly this crystallizes the thought that the saving water, which is baptism, is an earthly ordinance and cannot be performed by spirit beings while they dwell in the spirit world. Did not Paul say in this same connection, What shall they do which are which hmm. what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are then they baptized for the dead? And so we see a clear reference made to those prisoners in the spirit world who are waiting for the ordinance of who accepted the gospel. The Old Testament prophets knew the gospel just as well as the New Testament. The gospel's the same. They were taught the gospel, all of it. Gospel principle. It is only in and through Christ and his atonement will we all be able to be set free, whether it's here or in the spirit world. It will only be because of Christ. Zechariah 9, 13 through 17. Judah and Ephraim blessed. There will come a day when Judah and Ephraim will be one. All Israel will be united. The Lord will defend his people Israel against Greece, meaning symbolic the world. In that day, Israel will become as a crown of precious stones and an ensign to all people. 
Zechariah promises Israel, chapter 9, verses 12 through 17, that the Lord will render double to thee, that is, give her a double measure of glory in place of the suffering she has had in times past. Not only will the Lord liberate his people from bondage and captivity, but he will also give them strength to gain victory over the power of the world in order to subdue it completely. The sons of Zion will be pitted, according to Zechariah's figure, against the sons of Greece, meaning the world, who represent the Gentile world. We are working towards the great showdown between the sons of God and the sons of men. And I'm here to tell you, in case you don't know, the sons of God and Christ win. So, knowing that, it'd be stupid to be on the sons of the world, wouldn't it? But some in the church still choose it. For behold, for I bend Judah for me. Here is, here is now Zechariah's uh, <clears throat> description of how this represents of the Gentile world, the sons of Greece. For I bend Judah for me, I fill the bowl with Ephraim, and I stir up thy sons, O Zion, against thee, O Greece, and will make thee as the sword of a mighty man. Zechariah 9, 13. The sons of Zion will beat the sons of Greece or the world. That you can be assured of. This description reminds one of Micah's prediction concerning the way in which Israel shall triumph over her foes in the latter days. Zechariah proceeds to tell how the Lord will defend, will help defend and exalt his people. So quoting Zechariah, And the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as lightning, and the Lord God will blow the horn. You've got to understand ancient Israel, if the, the, the armies to go forth or uh, conquering armies coming, you would use the ram's horn, and they'd have a signal, and you'd blow the horn, and will go with whirlwinds of the south. The Lord of hosts will defend them, and they shall devour and shall tread down the sling stones, and they shall drink and make a noise as though, uh, as through wine, and they shall be filled like the basins, like the corners of the altar, and the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be as the stones of a crown, glittering over his land. For how great is their good goodliness, and how great is their beauty! Gank grain shall make the young men flourish, and new wine the maids. Zechariah 9, 14-17 As he prophesies, and so shall it be. Christ and his sons and daughters that are in his army, God's host, they will win. God will save them in that day and in all days. Zechariah 10, 1 through 12, follow the true shepherd. Jesus Christ is the true shepherd of our souls. He has control over the elements of nature and the power to save us eternally. Still, there were those who preferred to rely on false shepherds. They turned to soothsayers and idols for rain. But those who do not find themselves without a real shepherd, see verses 1 through 2. I'm sorry, I didn't read that good enough. But those who do will find themselves without a real shepherd. And so we see that today, brothers and sisters. What shepherd? Whose voice are we following? Those who follow Christ, on the other hand, will find a God who cares for his people. See verse 3. Who use them to carry out his purposes in the earth. Verses 4 through 5. And who will both restore both Judah and Ephraim to the rightful place before the Lord. Verses 6 through 12. Zechariah 10.4. What is the meaning of the symbols as they relate to Judah? Out of them is repeated four times in this verse. Judah will provide the cornerstone for security. In Isaiah 28, 16, this is a figure for the Davidic king. The tent peg or nail was the hook peg built into a wall to hold the implements of war as well as the household utensils. This is the attribute of reliability. 
The battle bowl refl refers to effective power and leadership. Every ruler, literally oppressor, usually the word is employed in a bad sense, but here it is used positively. Their prince leader will not oppress, but unjust will not oppress by unjust taxation or impose crushing burdens too great for the poor to bear. Boy, doesn't that describe today? Won't that be a glorious day? Finally. But will exact tribute from their vanquished enemies. Osterly described the above titles to Simon, Judas, and Jonathan Maccabeus, but each one of the four is undoubtedly messianic. The ultimate reference is to the lion of the tribe of Judah, by whose aid his people will conquer every foe. And so we see a great messianic verses here and their symbols and what they mean. Zechariah 10, 10 through 11, the gathering of Israel. Kyle and Delich explain, Egypt, as we have already shown at, is rather introduced in all the passages mentioned simply as a type of the land of bondage, on account of it having been the land in which Israel lived in the olden time under the oppression of the heathen world. And Ashur, or Assyria, is introduced in the same way as the land into which the ten tribes had been afterwards exiled. This typical symbolic significance is placed beyond all doubt by verse 11. Since the redemption of Israel out of the countries named is there exhibited under the type of the liberation of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt under the guidance of Moses. The Ephraimites are to return into the land of Gilead and Lebanon, the former representing the territory of the ten tribes in the olden times to the east of Jordan, the latter to the west. Gospel principle, Christ is our shepherd only in as much as we hear and hearken to the voice of the shepherd. What good is a shepherd if you don't heed the voice? Zechariah 11 is allegories of a good shepherd and the foolish shepherd. So let's take a look at that. Zechariah 11 is, prefaced to chap is a preface to chapters 12 through 13 in which Zechariah prophesies, prophesied of the battle of Armageddon. That's the great final last battle of the wicked nations combining against Israel and going to wipe out the Jewish nation. Verses, chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, is a prelude of judgment that serves as an introduction to the allegories that follow in verses 4 through 14, which describe the destruction of the political kingdom of Judah. Kyle and D.H. explained, The cedars and cypresses of Lebanon and the oaks of Bashan are simply figures denoting what is lofty, glorious, and powerful in the world of nature and humanity, and are only to be referred to and are only to be referred to persons so far as their lofty position in the state is concerned. Consequently, we get the following as the thought of these verses. The land of Israel, with all its power, full and glorious creatures, is to become desolate. Now, inasmuch as the desolation of a land also involves the desolation of the people living in the land and of its institutions, the destruction of the cedars, cypresses, etc., etc., does include the destruction of everything lofty and exalted in the nation and kingdom. So that in this sense, the devastation of Lebanon is a figurative representation of the destruction of the Israelitish kingdom, or of the dissolution of the political existence of the ancient covenant nation. This judgment was executed upon the land and people of Israel by the imperial power of Rome. This historical reference is evident from the description which follows of the facts by which this catastrophe is brought to pass. Chapter 11, verses 4 through 14, the Lord appointed a good shepherd to take care of the flock, which he wishes to deliver from oppression. That's verses 4 through 6. However, the flock was so lacking in appreciation verses 7 through 8, that would be Israel, that the shepherd, Christ, finally decided to discontinue his labors. That's what verses 9 through 14 are talking about. 11 verse 4, where it says, Feed the flock of slaughter, 
Flock of slaughter is an expression that may be applied either to a flock that is being slaughtered or to one that is destined to be slaughtered in the future. We know as it concerns Israel, both has happened to them. They were slaughtered and conquered and taken by Babylon and Assyria into exile and scattered throughout the world. And they will be slaughtered once again in the last battle where only a third will come through that war and be saved by Christ coming to the Mount of Olives and dividing it and them escaping between. Kylan Dielich said, But although a flock is eventually destined for slaughter, it is not fed for this purpose only, but generally to yield profit to its owner. Moreover, the figure of feeding is never used in the scriptures in the sense of making ready for destruction, but always denotes fostering an affectionate care for the preservation of anything. And in the case before us, the shepherd feeds the flock entrusted to him by slaying the three bad shepherds. And it is not till the flock has become weary of his tending that he breaks the shepherd's staves and lays down his pastoral office to give them up to destruction. So this is a good description of Israel. He does take care of them. He is fostering them. He is helping them. He's preserving them. But they won't heed the master. And so he gives up his pastoral office. Back to Kylan Dilich. Israel was given up by Jehovah into the hands of the nations of the world or the imperial powers to punish it for its sin. But as these nations abused the power entrusted to them and sought utterly to destroy the nation of God, which they ought only to have, chast have chastised, the Lord takes charge of his people as their shepherd because he will no longer spare the nations of the world. That is, will not any longer let them deal with his people as at pleasure, without being punished. The termination of the sparing will show itself in the fact that God causes the nations to destroy themselves by civil wars and to be smitten by tyrannical kings. This, these smite them in pieces, that is, devastate the earth by civil war and tyranny, without any interposition on the part of God to rescue the inhabitants of the earth or nations beyond the limits of Israel out of their hands or to put any restraint upon tyranny and self-destruction. We see that happened in the past. It is happening today. God lets the wicked kill the wicked. We see tyrannical nations killing each other and in civil war turning upon each other. This will continue until Christ comes. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Chapter 11, verses 5 through 6, the phrase, their own shepherd pity them not, means by the time of Christ, the office of high priest was, was bought who were poor shepherds, was bought and who were poor shepherds indeed who oppressed the people by fraud and ex ex exhortation. By the time of Christ in the New Testament, the high priest office is held by someone who's bought it. It's not held by one who's from the, the, the pri priestly line. And so their own shepherds pitied them not. The, the, this shepherd, he is not a good shepherd. He doesn't care about the Jewish people in the time of Christ. He doesn't pity them. He bought the office for prestige and glory and money. Very poor shepherd indeed. Chapter 11, verse 7, beauty better favor as a symbol of God's protecting care. And then the word bands meaning unity, a symbol of his desire to make peace among the people. Throughout Israel's history, Jehovah tries to unify and protect them. But by the time of Christ, Israel was broken and scattered. Verses 12 and 13 are so interesting, especially in connection with Matthew 27, 9 through 10. And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my hire, and if not, forbear. So the weight of my hire, thirty pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it into the treasury, the goodly price that I was prized at of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast it of them, literally it, cast it into the treasury, into the house of the Lord. Zechariah 11, 12-13. 
Indeed, this is an interesting verse in Zechariah because this is Judas and referring to him and the 30 pieces of silver. That's all Christ was worth to him. 30 pieces of silver. And he hangs himself because he understood after what he did. And so they give the money to the treasury. When Matthew tells the story of the end of Judas and his 30 pieces of silver, he seems to quote this passage from Zechariah, perhaps from memory. He attributes it, attributes it to Jeremiah. That could be an error on his part or an error through translation down through the ages. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the 30 pieces of silver and the price of him that was priced, whom some of the sons of Israel priced, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. That's Matthew 27, 9 through 10. No person who knows the passage of Zechariah can read that in Matthew without being struck by the similarity and all essential points between the two. But no such passage can be found in Jeremiah. The answer to this may lie in the corruption of the Greek text. In any event, we are primarily interested in the fact that the passage from Zechariah is regarded by Matthew as being fulfilled in the betrayal of the Christ and in the death and burial of Judas, the arch traitor. Zechariah 11, verses 15 through 17. When the good shepherd gives up shepherding the flock, the result is disastrous, for the Lord gives it into the care of a foolish shepherd. The latter not only neglects the sheep, but he eats the flesh of the fat and abuses the flock generally. That's verses 15 through 16. A woe is pronounced upon him, and he is to be visited with a terrible judgment. Verse 17, think of Herod, the two Herods, the kings of Israel and stuff. And they were not good shepherds. They were foolish shepherds. And did they ever neglect the Jewish people and all the other leaders from Christ on and, and before that? The chapter foreshadows the terrible affliction of the Jews subsequent to the rejection of the Messiah and the ultimate downfall of their overlords. That this ruler is spoken of as my shepherd offers significant light on the sovereignty of the divine rule over history. He is where he is by divine appointment, verse 16, and the scandalous acts which his wicked heart teaches him to perform are the Lord's dread judgments on a people who rejected the true shepherd. Reject Christ, brothers and sisters, and we will get bad leaders. We see that in the United States today. Reject God, and God will not protect even this, the United States. That is for sure declared in the Book of Mormon. Zechariah 12, the Lord to save Jerusalem and appear to the Jews. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. In a remarkable prophecy, yet awaiting fulfillment, Zechariah sees Judah and Jerusalem assaulted by the nations of the earth, which shall be gathered against it. That's verses 1 through 3. Jerusalem is a burdensome stone, that phrase means. Those nations that take in hand to capture and rule Jerusalem will find it difficult. Probably the idea is that of raising and carrying a boulder that is too heavy for a man's strength. Just think about the history from Christ up until now of Jerusalem and those who have tried to rule over that area. And how hard and burdensome it has been. It's still burdensome today. Through the aid of the Lord, the inhabitants of Jerusalem are to be defended and the most of, and most of the armies of the nations destroyed. That's what it's talked about in verses 4 through 9. Then shall the Messiah appear, and there shall come a change upon the Jews. In the words of the record, And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look unto me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. That's Zechariah 12.10. Boy, has that ever been fulfilled? Or I'm sorry, is that, that is yet to be fulfilled. The inhabitants of Jerusalem are looking for the spirit of grace and supplication. 
one day they will look to the king whom they did pierce. And one day the descendants of those people that did the piercing will see the marks in his hands and his feet. And then they will come to know who he really was. Chapter 12, verse 11, Morning of Hadadrimon, Hadadrimon, we'll have to try that one three times fast, in the valley of Megadon. In verse 11, the depth and bitterness of the pain on account of the slain Messiah are depicted by comparing it to the morning of Hadadrimon. Jerome says with regard to this, quoting Jerome, Adrimon, Ad Ad Adrimanon is a city near Jerusalem, which is formerly called by its name, but is now called Maximinopolis, in the field of Macedon, where the good King Josiah was wounded by Pharaoh Necho. The mourning of Hadad Ramon is therefore the mourning for the calamity which befell Israel at Hadad Ramon, in the death of the good king, Josiah, who was mortally wounded in the valley Megiddo, according to Second Chronicles 35, 22-24, so that he very soon gave up the ghost. The death of this most pious of all the kings of Judah was bewailed by the people, especially the righteous members of the nation, so bitterly that they not only did the prophet so bitterly that not only did the prophet Jeremiah compose an elegy on his death, but other singers, both male and female, bewailed him in dirges, which were placed in a collection of elegetic songs and preserved in Israel till long after the captivity. That's found in Second Chronicles 35:25. Zechariah compares the lamentation for the for the putting of the Messiah to death to this great national mourning. So the great righteous king, Josiah, in Second Chronicles, when he dies in the mourning that they had, is symbolic of the mourning to the death of the Messiah, the mourning they'll have when they finally realize what the Messiah went through them, went through for them. Chapter 12, verses 11 through 14. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem. There will be great mourning in that day for at least three reasons. One, many Jews will have been killed by the besieging armies. That will cause a lot of mourning. Two, families will be scattered and able to contact one another. And three, the saved Jews will realize that he whom they have long rejected and whom their forefathers persecuted and killed is truly the Messiah for whom they waited for so long. So that's what verse 11 through 14 are also about. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, they, Then they will accept him as their Redeemer, which they, will never, which they have never been willing to do. Then is the time is spoken of in this passage from Zechariah, when every family will go and mourn apart. The house of David, the house of Nathan, the Jews, they will fall down, they will rend their garments, they will mourn, and they will weep because they were not willing to accept the Son of God but accepted the teachings of their fathers and rejected the Redeemer and Messiah. Then will they fall down at his feet and worship him. After these days will come their redemption and the building of Jerusalem. They will be given their own land again, and every man will live under his own vine and his own fig tree, and they will learn to love the Lord and keep his commandments and walk in the light. And he will be their God, and they will be his people. And that is right at our doors. Could you imagine that the tradition in your religion, and then if you follow that religion within your family, for thousands of years, finding out that your ancestors, the one whom they killed and crucified, was the Messiah. And how that was handed down from generation to generation to generation those false teachings and how maybe all of that persecution to Jews from the time of Christ up until this time could have been avoided if they just would have accepted their Messiah. No wonder they will mourn and well. 
Do you imagine all of that having been false teachings? Gospel principle, all that has been prophesied concerning Israel and Jerusalem will be fulfilled. Israel, all Israel, the Jews, all the house of Israel will come to know that Jesus Christ, the great Jehovah, is the great Messiah. Zechariah chapter 13, Jude and Jerusalem, to be holy unto the Lord. Chapter 13, verse 1, Sidney B. Sperry said, Following the great events of which we have spoken, Jude and Jerusalem are to become holy unto the Lord. In Zechariah 13, 1, it is stated that a fountain will be opened for sin and for uncleanliness to the Jews. Many views have been given respecting the meaning of this passage, but in the absence of more specific information, the writer... Sidney Sperry, suggests that it has reference to the ordinance of baptism. When the Jews have recognized in the Christ their long-looked-for Messiah, what is more natural than to suppose that the gospel would preach to them in the essential ordinances the church administered? So yes, I agree with him. This is probably in reference to baptism, the fountain that, a fountain that is open to you that gives you living water. These will be interesting times and deeds, and to witness these events, the long look for Messiah, and what, what a pity it is that it is going to take wiping out two-thirds of the state of Israel and the Jewish people there now in the great battle of Armageddon before they will come to realize and come to recognize Christ. It will take that much carnage and destruction. Hopefully it doesn't take that in our part, brothers and sisters. Chapter 13, verses 2 through 5. False prophets are to cease their activities and current idolatrous practices are to be eliminated. Chapter 13, verse 7, the shepherd who would be smitten. The shepherd of Israel is Jesus Christ. The sheep are those who know his voice, that is, members of the church. The, offend, the, offending, of the, the offending of the disciples took place when Jesus was taken prisoner and they all fled. This flight was a prelude to the dispersion of the flock at the death of the shepherd. That's Christ. But the Lord soon brought back his hand over the disciples. The promise, but after my resurrection, I will go before you into Galilee is a practical exposition of the bringing back of the hand over the small ones, which shows that the expression is to be understood here in a good sense and that it began to be fulfilled in the gathering together of the disciples by the risen Savior. This special fulfillment did not indeed exhaust the meaning of the verses before us, but they had a much more general fulfillment in the whole of the nation of Israel. And so he's going to continue to gather his disciples, those who have sense enough to come. Chapter 13, verses 8 through 9. The destruction of Jerusalem will be so great that two-thirds, as I said, of the people will be destroyed, while the one-third that remain will be brought through the fire and will, re and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. And they shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. I bet those events would refine you if you went through that. Just think what all the persecution and killings and uh, that the Missouri saints went through. And then later in Nauvoo and in Kirtland, those who stayed firm in the church were refined and brought through the fire. Well, the Jews, those who survive it will be brought through the fire. Gospel principle, God will have a humble people and a holy people, brothers and sisters. We can either choose to be humble and holy, or God will have a humble and holy people. Do you catch the meaning? The Jews decided not to choose of themselves to be holy and humble. So what is going to happen? God will have a holy and humble people, even if it takes the destruction 
of their nation and the killing of two-thirds of the people. God loves us too much to just leave us to Satan. Even if killing and destruction and warfare brings you back, if that's what it takes, then that's what it takes. Christ hopes we do not choose that. May we choose today, brothers and sisters, to just choose to be holy and humble. But if not, God will have a holy and humble people. And let this serve as a witness on how and what lengths he's willing to go through to get us to that state. We are better off just choosing it. Zechariah 14, Jerusalem is saved. 14, verses 1 through 5, When Jerusalem is taken, and the house is rifled, and the woman ra women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as he f fought in the day of battle. Zechariah 14, 2 through 3. Christ shall appear on the Mount of Olives and divide it in two, so that those who are left can escape. This, evident, this event is also recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants, where it says, Doctrine and Covenants 45, 48 through 53, and then, this is the time of that great war, that great battle, the nations that are coming to destroy the state of Israel and the Jews. Then shall the Lord set his foot upon the Mount Olives, they will have pushed the people and wiped, starting up at the north, clear up by the Jezreel Valley, up by Megiddo. And that army will just come down south and just keep wiping it out. And they get to Jerusalem, and the Jews' backs are against the wall. Because the Mount of Olives are there, there is no escape. Then shall the Lord set his foot upon this Mount Olivet, and it shall clave in twain. And the earth shall tremble and reel to and fro, and shall also shall shake. And the Lord shall utter his voice, and all the ends of the earth shall hear it. And the nations of the earth shall mourn, and they that have laughed shall see their folly. And calamity shall cover the mocker, and the scorner shall be consumed. And that they have watched for iniquity shall be hewn down and cast into the fire. And then shall the Jews look upon me and say, What are the wounds in thy hands and in thy feet? Then shall they know. <clears throat> that I am the Lord, for I will say unto them, These wounds are the wounds which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I am he who was lifted up. I am Jesus that was crucified. I am the Son of God. And then shall they weep because of their iniquities. Then shall they lament because they persecuted their king. We've already described how Zechariah said that that will be a great day of mourning. Brothers, sisters, that is not the second coming. That is an event prior to his millennial reign. That's why I said the second coming is not this year. It's not next year. Well, unless that amount of olives happens this year. This is an event. Christ, Christ comes several different times before he comes to rule and reign as the Messiah during the millennial time. And this is one of them. Chapter 14, verses 6 through 7. These verses seem to indicate that the sign of a night and a day, as if one day will be repeated. And it shall come to pass, this is quoting Zechariah now, 14, 9, 6, 6 through 7. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day what shall be known to the Lord. Not day or night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. Unless this is referring to something else I have not come across, the only thing so far that I've been able to fit that this seems to be that prior to Christ being born in the American continent, the night, the day, the night, and the day as if one day, this seems to indicate that that is repeated. Now, if that's not the interpretation of this verse and that never happens, we're fine. Uh, your salvation will not be at stake. But if that sign is repeated, <laughs> no, we are coming very nigh, very nigh unto the millennial reign. 14 verse 8, perhaps due to the sp splitting, that should be splitting of the Mount of Olives, water will issue forth from Jerusalem. 
This is probably the same instance that Ezekiel prophesied about in Ezekiel 47, 1 through 8, when living water will flow from beneath the temple in Jerusalem and will heal the Dead Sea. So this referring to water issuing forth out of Jerusalem in verse 8 here in Zechariah 14 probably comes out because of the splitting of the mound there. Can you imagine the earthquake that is going to cause for that to happen? And maybe that is what causes the living water to come forth from underneath the temple, as it says in Ezekiel 47, that will then then flow down into the Dead Sea and that will become a freshwater lake. That hasn't happened yet either. And so that's why I know the second coming is not this year. And unless it happens next year, it's not next year. The Lord in that day shall be king over all the earth. Zechariah 14, 9. Palestine shall no longer be cursed, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. 14, 10 through 11. Most of the peoples who have warred against Jerusalem shall be come to a terrible end, and their wealth shall be swept, and their wealth shall be swept up. That's uh, chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. The remnant then are left shall be converted and are to worship the Lord. That's verses 16 through 19. After the Jews escape, see, now God can, you, you have this army, John, in the book of Revelation says the size of this army is 200 million. That is quite a gathering of the nations. This is a wicked army. They're all together. Now God can take one swipe, just like a fly swatter, bam. <laughs> he can now kill a big, big group of wicked people on the earth. Chapter 14, verse 16 through 19. Will there be heathen or non-Israelites who survive Armageddon? Are there going to be non-members at the second coming and after Armageddon? Well, the prophet Joseph Smith taught, While in conversation at Judge Adams' during the evening, I said Christ and the resurrected saints will reign over the earth during a thousand years. They will not probably dwell on the earth, but will visit it when they please, or when it is necessary to govern it. So those who have been resurrected, and, uh, he's talking about. There will be wicked men on the earth during the thousand years. Now understand, it's either in section 84 or 88, God defines the wicked, those who have not made covenants with him. It doesn't have to be somebody committing adultery, okay? Yes, there will be non-members during that time. That's why there's going to be great mission work. We're still going to go out and probably gather Israel. The heathen nations who will not come to worship will be visited with the judgments of God and must eventually be destroyed from the earth. Because we know by the end of the millennium, all will know God. All will have become members of the church. All will have entered into the covenant of Israel. So that's going to be a process. We're going to see a mission where we'll see them slowly dying off or, as it says, change in the twinkling eye when it's time to die during that time period. So things will change. But by the end, everyone on the earth towards the end of the millennium, all will belong to the house of Israel through the covenant of baptism. Elder Bruce Army Conkey commented, During the millennium, however, the Lord will use the forces of nature to turn people's attention to the truth. Whoso will not come up, said Zechariah, of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of lords, even upon them shall be no rain. So evidently through natural disaster and different things, who will slowly kill off those who will not enter into the covenant. God is not forcing people to join the church, even during the millennial reign. Isn't that interesting? Even Christ comes and will declare which church this is and which is the true church. And people still will not want to join. That is mind-boggling to me. Chapter 14, verses 20 through 21. Why will the bells of the horses have holiness unto the Lord on them? In beautiful imagery, Zechariah taught that in the millennial peace and right in the millennium, Peace and righteousness will prevail to the to a point where everything symbolized by such trifles as the trappings on horses and earthen jars shall be holy and pure, and where there shall be no more the Canaanite, meaning the wicked, in the house of the Lord of hosts. So that's what he's trying to refer to when he says, even the bells on the horses will have written holiness of the Lord, meaning everything will become pure and holy. 
Well, the gospel principle, one day Jerusalem will be a faithful and righteous city, and Judah will be restored, where the law of the Lord will go forth. Israel will be gathered out. The ten tribes will come back prior <coughs> excuse me, to the millennial reign of Christ, prior to that second coming, <coughs> when he comes to rule and reign on the earth. The ten tribes will have come back also. That is separate from the gathering of Israel. I believe it's our tenth article of faith, or go and look to when it is. We believe in the rest. We believe in the gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the ten tribes. Now, <coughs> whether the ten tribes are restored prior to the Mount of Olives or not, that I have no idea. But the ten tribes will come back and be restored as a nation, as a group, and receive their covenants in the temples prior to Christ's second coming. So that's why I said second coming is not this year. It's probably not next year because I have not seen the ten tribes come back yet and receive their temple blessings. Well, brothers and sisters, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and please subscribe to the channel.